Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hail Reaper. My name is Philip, and this is my good friend Jeremy. What's up, dude? Not a lot. I am excited <laughs> and nervous. We uh, are getting into something new, and uh, yeah. it, it kind of feels like uh, when you're in high school and you're those productions, and it's like opening night and the curtain's about to go up, and you only have three lines in the whole play, and you <laughs> might forget them anyway. That's, that's what I feel like in- right now. You were in How to Succeed. What was the play you were in in high school? I did a couple, but the one you're thinking of is How to Succeed in Business I'm Without Really Trying. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. a wonderful, wonderful show. How many lines did you have? I had one. You had that, one? In that, yeah. I, <laughs> I primarily did dancing and I, I handled that kind of end of things. You were ensemble. So. Is that what it's called? Primarily, yes. Yeah. yeah. What was the line? Do you remember the line? I don't. <laughs> we need to get the VHS tape out. We'll watch it. Is there a VHS tape of this? I have this, yeah. Oh my gosh. Try to find a VHS player, though. That's that's oh, going to be true. the real trouble I mean, right now. <laughs> yeah, that'd be so funny if, like, Math Hard just actually had, like, all of a sudden just spliced in <laughs> a chorus ensemble version of you just, like, it's like, Donna, Donna, doing the can-can. Please don't like that. give Math Hard ideas. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> what if, what if Math Hard took someone doing that on YouTube and just photoshopped your head on top of someone doing that? That might work. And would that be better? That might work, yeah. Okay, well, let's, well, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. We'll make it happen. So why don't we go ahead and just kind of recap, like we've been, you know, we've not been doing podcasts for, you know, a couple months now, we're back, we're going to be hitting some stuff pretty hard, but why don't you go ahead and kind of fill people in kind of what your life's been like the last couple months and I'll do the same in a second. Honestly, my life has kind of been routine. Uh, yeah. Work has been dominated a lot of that, just uh, still busy with kind of COVID regulations and precautions and, and uh, taking my time up with that. Uh, other than that, just dadding hard, yeah. you know, <laughs> doing uh, clay with the kids and some other things that they're really interested in having fun with. Yeah, I same here. It's just like, it's just dad life to the max. So uh, my youngest is almost one now. I remember like when we started the Golden Sun, uh, like season or like event that I was like, I think he was like just like a month or so old or just barely. He was just like a little, little dude. So now it's like, whoa, like he's almost a year. So a lot of, it feels like no time has passed and a ton of time has passed. And it's using Hail Reaper as a barometer for (laughs) what time has gone. So it's the same, like we've been busy, like with like personal stuff, but we're really excited to get back and talk about the dream of EO. So that brings me to story time. So I can tell you a story in two different ways. You can okay. sit on the story uh, mat and I can do that. Or I can tuck you in and I could kiss your forehead and I can tell you the story that way. How do you want me to tell you the story? Could we <laughs> pretend that my chair is a story mat? Okay, let's do that. Yeah, I don't think you should sit on the floor. I think you'd be out of the shot unless you can just see your head and kind of floating above. So that's Yeah, that'd be awkward. Call. So. Um, well, let's talk about the reason why I wanted to kind of talk about what we're going, what our roadmap is for these future episodes and kind of what this episode of the next six will be like, because it's a whole event that we've been thinking about and working on for quite some time. But I want to kind of start back at the beginning and start with the inspiration. We were wrapping up the Golden Sun event, the, the season. We use those terms interchangeably. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, I really want our Morning Star conversations to feel different. I know for like those people who have listened to all our episodes, we talked about Red Rising and we talked about like characters and we kind of use the characters to frame up the conversation. And even like you can look at our episode titles like Darrow, EO, Dancer, and Mickey, they're all kind of like they're this linear path of the story, but using the characters to frame up the narrative. And we did something very similar with our Golden Sun season or Golden Sun event is we uh, did that same thing, but we talked about the themes that those characters bring forth. And then I was thinking, well, we got to do something a little different, a little bigger, grander, because this is Morningstar. Like, this is a big deal. This is the bow. This is the cherry on top of an entire first trilogy. And I wanted it to feel different. I wanted to have a different, its own flavor and not kind of be something that felt the same as the last two seasons. 
So I remember thinking of a bunch of ideas and thinking they're all bad. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, this isn't going to really work very well. Um, I, didn't even, I didn't even present them to you or Mathar because I didn't believe in them at all. Okay. So I'm kind of down on myself a little bit. I'm like, ah, what is this going to be? What is this going to be about? And so I sat on my couch. My family's asleep. I just instinctually go, well, I just need to open up Morningstar. I need to look at it. So I open up the book on my phone because I'm an ebook reader. And I just went to the last pages and I fell onto this paragraph, the last few sentences in the entire first trilogy. When I first stepped through the gates of the Institute, I wore the weight of the world on my shoulders. It crushed me, broke me, but my friends have pieced me together. Now they each carry a part of Eo's dream. Together we can make a world fit for my son, for the generations to come. I can be a builder, not just a destroyer. Eo and Fitchner saw that when I could not. So whether they wait for me in the veil or not, I feel them in my heart. I hear their echo beating across the worlds. I see them in my son. And when he is old enough, I will take him on my knee and his mother and I will tell him of the rage of Ares, the strength of Ragnar, the honor of Cassius, the love of Severo, and the loyalty of Victra, and the dream of Eo, the girl who inspired me to live for more. And I was like, this is it. This is it. And, you know, it's, it's, it just felt like so right. And I've been thinking about this a lot for a long time. And you have too. We all think about this, math are included. The reason we love Red Rising, we love the story of Red Rising, is the characters. And how the characters bring so much to the story itself. But what do we love about the characters? We love the qualities they bring into the story. They bring the qualities of rage. They bring the qualities of strength and honor and love and loyalty. And all these things kind of are the DNA, or at least we think they are, the DNA of Eo's dream and what make it so special. And so part of the conversation we're going to have, or basically the larger conversation we're having, is taking all these little qualities and how they make one bigger picture. They make Eo's dream, or at least we believe that, and that's the conversation we're going to explore and have throughout this season or throughout this event, which is gonna be seven full episodes. So I am incredibly excited and I'm ready to go. And this is our roadmap. You know, I remember uh, that phone call you were referring to. Normally you're a pretty reserved kind of guy. Uh, you would normally just call me and you say, hey, I've got some ideas I'd like to pitch, wanna get your take on it. And you're sort of open for criticism <laughs> and, and a little tweaking, but this distinctly was very different. You called and you were like, no compromises. I know what this is. And here's my plan. Right. Mm -hmm. And you laid out the dream of you and I didn't have any issue. I, I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. That's it. <laughs> and it, it just fell into place. I, I think when you think of, um, like you were saying, when we look at some of these books, um, you have characters, you have themes and you have kind of like plot lines in the story that are really fun to explore for us. And I like that, that the dream of EO um, where we were calling it Morning Star Event before we got the name Dream of You. It gives us a chance to explore Morning Star in that same context and look at those things that we really are desiring to talk about. But it's through a lens of these qualities, of these characters, and it transcends just Morning Star. It's going to require us to actually look at the entirety of the trilogy and really kind of put this end cap and 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 be a holistic kind of view of the dream of EO, but while exploring some of these fun things in Morningstar. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely an exploration of all three books looking, you know, we've kind of compartmentalized your Red Rising and Golden Sun in like in our other seasons, but now we're like, well, no, we're going to, we're not going to compartmentalize at all. We're going to be talking about this whole trilogy as one big storyline. And we want to talk about, again, those qualities and what, what is the dream of EO? That's the central tenet. That's the question we're going to be asking ourselves every episode. What is the dream of EO and how do these things, do they or don't they feed into it? Do they make it up? Are they the mm. DNA? So really fun conversation, really big conversation. 
Yeah. Um, and we're going to try to bring definition to it as best we can over the course of time. Let's go ahead and take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk more about what is the dream of EO. Awesome. Broadcast here. It's been a minute. I know I said I was only going on holiday, but you know how these things are. There I was, so far from the core, sipping a lovely drink made from some sort of exotic fruit. Anyway, imagine my chagrin when I get a call from the goblin about some falling out between friends, followed by an outright betrayal on Mars. One thing leads to another, and all of a sudden it's full-on guerrilla warfare. Now you get the idea. It's been a wild year. In my absence, it would seem we've had a fair bit of correspondence, and you lot seem to be carrying on just fine, so that's swell. I've got a few of you to thank for all the support in these trying times. Best get on with it. To everyone who supported our Patreon drive by raising their pledge to a five or ten dollar tier, we honestly cannot thank you enough. In fact, I will say it every episode from here on out just to prove my point. Thank you. Now, for all the supporters who made the leap over to our Discord server and got christened with a sexy new Halla name, thought it only right to give you a shout all the way from Deepgrave for making this such an incredible community to call home. Shout out to Riptide, Troubadour, Huntsman, Spinner, Neverland, Bluebird, Rosius, Cyborg, Sharkbait, Eagle Eye, Foil, and Seahawk. And a special shout out to Artificer, Scepter, Huntsman, Data, Cataclysm, and Ivy for supporting us during that drive by raising your tier. Now, if you were part of that wave of supporters and I didn't call you out, it's because you don't have a gory damn howler name yet. So, get on over to the Discord and get in line, you pixies. Now, how about a little word from our sponsor? If you're seeking legal counsel or in a situation that you're not sure how to handle, Terrigian Law might just be the answer. They offer a free consultation to assess your situation because not every attorney is the right professional for the job. Now, the great thing about Terrigian Law is that there's no double speak, no confusing language, no upfront commitment. It's just a conversation with someone who wants to understand what you're going through and help you get to the next step. Getting started is easy. Call 559-627-5399 or visit terrigianlaw.com. That's T-O-R-I-G-I-A-N-L-A-W.com. No matter the circumstance, we all deserve peace of mind. So stop sitting with the uncertainty and get the advice you need today. Once again, that's T-O-R-I-G-I-A-N-L-A-W.com or call 559-627-5399. Terrigian Law. The advice you need, minus the BS. Jeremy, we're back from break. We're going to be talking today about what is the dream of EO. And we've been in this process for a while, you and I. We've been talking about what is it and how do we bring definition to it? How do we talk about it? We we have an idea of what we think it is, but it's not so clear cut. It's not like, oh, this is it and this is why and this is how. It's a conversation that deserves a lot of dialogue. It's a lot of back and forth. And we've done that already, but we want to bring that onto our podcast and talk more about it and even uh, have that process of discovery with people and kind of even with ourselves because we're still not done. We're, we have a lot more to talk about. Yeah. So you've kind of come up with this framework that I've really enjoyed. It's these three different proposals of what we think the dream of EO could be. And we'll discuss more in the future, but for today's episode, we're going to be focusing on three different things of what the dream of EO could be. So why don't you go and take it away because you've thought of this. Yeah, so in, in prepping for the episode, um, and we were framing up kind of our doc that we use, and you originally kind of asked me to come somewhat locked and loaded with kind of an answer to what is the dream of EO to you? And after thinking about it a long time and, and kind of looking into that, I realized that I walked away with more questions than I did answers. And I realized that like the dream of EO is, is a really massive concept, and it's not that simple to answer. So uh, like you framed it perfectly. I, I wanted to share this kind of three additional questions that I walked away with. So the first one is, is the dream of EO just that? Is it exactly what EO espoused? This clean, simple idea of just liberty, mm -hmm. right? And in chapter four of Red Rising, when she's in the garden, she says, I live for the dream that my children will be born free, that they will be what they like, that they will own the land their father gave them. So is that exactly as she espouses. Is that the dream? Just plain, simple autonomy, agency within her own life. Mm -hmm. The second one is, is the dream something that society takes on, right? Mm -hmm. Because right after this scene in the garden, she goes to her death. And like I've argued before, she kind of 
you know, Eo dies and Persephone comes out and it becomes the embodiment of the dream. And the interesting thing about that is you find that the dream it can be found kind of on a spectrum, right? Because every color um, from the top down to the bottom kind of takes a different interpretation based on their station, based on the level of oppression and a couple other things. So they're going to interpret it differently and they're going to act out how that dream is going to impact their lives very differently. The third question I came out with is, is the dream internalized by Darrow to be himself? We know that Dancer kind of approaches him with this idea of you're the dream keeper, but that's kind of this expression of exclusive to Red. Um, but Darrow really takes that and we find it a couple different points in Red Rising as well as Golden Sun. He actually says, no, no, I am the dream. You have no idea. Like, that's my wife. It came out of my life. And you're looking at Persephone. You have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'm the only one that can act upon this. Yeah. I think for me, like when I read the book for the first time and definitely the second time, because I read the first trilogy twice before Iron Gold came out, before it was even a, like a thing it existed. I took number three as like what I thought the dream was. Uh, the dream of EO is Darrow. It's his journey. It's his POV. It's his books. It's the books called Red Rising. The trilogy is called Red Rising. It's like, okay, like I know what this is. And over the course of time, as you read the books, you reread the books, you realize that would be reductive. That is not actually what I feel is fully true. But like to your point, you said that there's a lot of times where Darrow says, you know, I'm the dream or he mentions those moments. Uh, but I think we've noticed that Darrow can be, you know, over time, again, you when you read the books more and more, you get kind of more clarity of the situation of the story that Darrow is that unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. So it's not really exactly what we thought. But what about you? So you read the book the first time, second time, maybe those first initial reads. Where did you land? Did you think the dream of Eo was how I thought of it as like Darrow is the dream and he's the dream keeper? Absolutely. Yeah, I I did because. It, again, for all the reasons you stated, right? It's Red Rising. It makes yeah. a lot of sense that that would be it, that, that Darrow's your protagonist. He's going to carry that dream forward. Um, I, I think I didn't give much credence to Eo, and I kind of breezed over her in a sense, uh, similar to Darrow. You know, he's he's kind of fixated on this very different life. Um, you know, he's he just wants the white picket fence, and he's not really attuned to what she's saying. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of, moves right past it. And I, I find that I did the same. Um, but I think one of the the arguments against that and why I, I tend to lean away from that being the dream, again, I'm not definitive in my answer. I don't, I don't know. I want to further explore this. But a scene like the gala, right, where he's he has got an explosive on him. He's ready to blow it all to hell and take him along with it. And similar to the scene in The Lock in Red Rising, where, you know, he believes that the dream is going to die with him in this moment. Yeah. And how can that be the dream of you? Like, it hasn't reached any sort of conclusion. Yeah. Nobody's free. Nobody has agency yet in the society outside of gold. So to me, that just doesn't seem like it could be. Darrow is in this constant state of rationalizing. You know, Darrow is a really brooding character, a really emo character. As a fellow emo, I can call him that. <laughs> um, but he's always in the state of like, he's very unsure of himself. Externally, I think he presents a, you know, a big presence, but internally he's kind of small. Like he's, and he's always questioning and second guessing. The one thing I know that I, th well, one thing that I know, but the one thing I believe rather, I should say, is the dream of EO, if anything, it's like its own character. It has an arc. It has like, it's, it's, it kind of progresses. And I think a lot of it does progress with Darrow in a way because Darrow is in this constant process of re re like refinement of like what he thinks, what he believes. And he's always saying, I think this is what EO would have wanted. Or I, if I die right now, the dream of EO dies. Or I think EO would have said this is good enough. Like getting this far would have been good enough. Like he's always bringing her into it as if like he's chasing not even really the dream, but he's chasing her, her approval, a dead woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, not to be cavalier, but he's actually always in the state of like, I think that Eo would have been okay with this or is this Eo's dream? He says that in the gala. He's like, he kind of comes to his senses and realizes like, this isn't the dream of Eo, but he was ready to blow everyone to high hell. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it doesn't feel quite right to say the dream of Eo is Darrow exclusively, even though, again, Dancer, said, I think chapter 11 or 12, Dancer's like, no, you're the dream keeper. You're not just a weapon that we can use no matter what Harmony says. Right. Like you're the dream keeper. So we take that at face value. It's easy to take that at face value because 
we're just readers. We're just experiencing the book. We're all long for the ride, the ride of Darrow for the, for the good and for the bad. But it's, again, it's maybe too small of a prism to view the dream of EO as exclusively through Darrow's lens. And I, I think that it has much more to do with outside forces, not just the, that internal singular force. Yeah. So let's pivot to that other thing. Let's pivot to the simple idea of liberty. EO's just her words that you read the quote earlier, like, I live for the dream that my children can be born and free. They will be what they like. They will own the land their father gave them. This feels, I don't know, it feels like kind of right. right? You know, like, if, if on <laughs> yeah. face value, again, it feels like kind of right. So why don't you talk to that just a little bit more about this proposal? Of, is this the dream of EO, like her statement? So I think for me, this is the one that I'm not saying I necessarily am definitive that this is the dream of EO. But this is the one that I want to lean toward yeah. because it's beautiful. It uh, has a clean aesthetic and it's just such a simple concept that anybody in society, no matter your station, no matter where you are, should have autonomy, freedom, and agency to do as you like in life. Yeah. Like what more could you ask for? Yeah. You know? And um, the thing is, is like, like I said earlier, you know, Daryl blazed past it. I think this is easy to miss for us because you just kind of get carried through that same whirlwind uh, that Daryl did. And we just get fixated on, on him being the main character and him holding that dream. But one thing that, that is true about this simple thing is, you know, you could ask like, is it too simple? And maybe yes, maybe no. But, yeah, but one point. thing that I think is definitive about this statement is that it is delicate. It is, it is beautiful. And it's like what, what EO says is like the seed, you know, something tiny and simple. And if you plant it and you water it and nourish it, it's going to grow into a gorgeous tree, a strong and robust one. And I think that's probably what I take away from this as one of the components of the dream of EO. I want to take a time out and say the Jeremy analogies are back, everyone. So we've, we've brought them, <laughs> we brought them back. They're here. You can, uh, you can, you can hear the Jeremy analogies on other episodes uh, in the past, but we got a brand new one here. Great, great analogy. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so no, uh, <laughs> for me, like the dream of EO being EO is just simple voice of, I live for the dream that, you know, da, 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 da. It makes so much sense. There's a lot of clarity to that. There's a want to oh, like. There's a desire for that belief to go. This is the dream of you. How can it not be? She's the speaker. This is her thing. But that dream that she offers in this garden scene in chapter four isn't Darrow's dream at all. It's thrown on him. It's a mantle that he's forced to carry, and he has to learn over time what it even is. There's a moment in chapter thirty-five of Morning Star that finally. Daryl understands what she was talking about. And that's a good, mm -hmm. so we're not gonna talk about that right now because it's it's big and we wanna unpack that with more time, but it's a great scene. It's a conversation between Severo and Daryl. And it's this it's this understanding, a final definitive understanding of what the dream of EO is for Daryl, at least for him, his character. Um, but when I go back and I've read the story many times, even if I read it now, like reading it in, in preparation for this, I forget about this all the time because you'll get, like you said, you use the word term whirlwind. Mm -hmm. Red Rising is intense. There is, it's adrenaline. It is fast. Like Pierce Brown, his writing style is so fluid. It is not necessarily, it's, it's retrospective, but, mo and it's not like scenic. He's not taking time to describe the coffee cup or the mountain or whatever. Like, so the the like where you're at like in the book the rhythm of the book is fast it's very fast so you it kind of eludes you like to go back and go oh yeah the dream is this idea of freedom and liberty it feels like it feels like one in three like the th proposals like eo's dream and then daryl being dream keeper are kind of working against you <laughs> because right, yeah. they're in conflict almost and so it so for me it doesn't either that doesn't really quite feel right either because the book becomes so grand you're going to mars you're going to the pole of mars to meet you know ragnar's family and Sefi. you're going to all you know you're going to get quicksilver on daimos and phobos you're going or all these different plant you're going to all these different planets you're going everywhere meeting new characters the universe gets so expansive so fast that this idea that was spoken back in chapter four of the first book it feels lost on you in a lot of ways. And even for me still, like 
it's only through this conversation that I remember <laughs> that this actually happened and that it's important and that it has a framework for all, a lot of future events to come. But for me, it's something that get, gets kind of lost. Yeah, you have, sure. What else? Yeah, look, you have something to say on this. No, no, I'm good. Okay, well, let's move on then to this last proposal, this idea of the dream of EO. You said, I like this terminology, putting it on a spectrum. So why don't you talk to this a little bit more in detail of like the, your final proposal here? Yeah, th this is that its intrinsic meaning is dependent on your station and kind of what you need to gain in order to have that freedom and achieve it. And that could be anywhere from, you know, some of the children now uh, kind of post first trilogy being born sigilous, yeah. right? Um, the thing that I like to hone in on the most is Ragnar's story because he was a slave. He was the, the second from the bottom tier. And I think that Pierce wrote Ragnar's story in one of the most elegant, beautiful ways ever. And when Darrow approaches him, Darrow doesn't come with freedom wrapped in a little gift bag. And he's like, <laughs> hey, I have a present for you because freedom is an inalienable right. Mm -hmm. that, that's God given. It's not something that you hand off to other people and say, hey, I got something for you. Here's some freedom, <laughs> right? <laughs> You, you Fourth start, of July, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you start with freedom. And Pierce caught that, right? He internalized that in the story. It's something that was just on the table. And all Darrow did was call it out. He mm -hmm. said, Ragnar, you're free. Whether or not you want to pick it up is your choice. Yeah. But you make your choice and let me know. This one of all, like the three proposals you brought today, like, you know, is the dream of EO. Eo's simple action, her simple words that she offers Daryl, or is the dream of Eo Daryl? Is he the dream keeper exclusively? This one feels the most right to me. This one is like it being kind of, there's a balance to it where it can, all colors, even gold have been marginalized. Like, cause like you read and like, if you go into read the graphic novels, which are the prequels, which Sons of Aries volume one and volume two, Fitchner himself as a bronzy is incredibly marginalized and mm -hmm. impressed by society. Those are really worth a read if you haven't checked those out, by the way. Do it. Yes, so good. And they kind of put even like gold is only its own little pyramid itself. Like it has its own little stations where even peerless can be marginalized over time. Bronzies are incredibly marginalized. But so it looks different to a lot of different people. But this is why I like this one. This is why I think that this might be, I know we'll discuss, I'm not going to say definitively, like you said earlier, I'm not going to say definitively, this is the dream of EO, but it feels the most right, like putting on a spectrum. Yeah, I, th I think on face value, I agree. And when I was thinking, that's where I went, right? That ultimately I'm probably going to land up here. Um, but the thing about spectrums, the thing about society kind of interpreting things for themselves is that you can have these wonderful cases, right? Where even Mustang being a gold is humming the song of Persephone because mm -hmm. she understands as a reformer, like what are we trying to do here? But the exact inverse can be true too. Some of the greatest atrocities for mankind have been kind of with good intentions, right? And there's tons of them. You, you can point to anybody, but kind of one of the larger uh, famines in all of human history is something you know that Chairman Mao in China caused during the Great Leap Forward. And the whole idea was that he was gonna take this agrarian society and move them forward at a rapid rate and surpass Great Britain in their in the in like their economic power within 15 years. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if you just say that, I, it doesn't sound like there's anything wrong with it, right? But, yeah. It sounds but, like you're trying to push or elevate your society. Right? Exactly. That, yeah. Those are good things, right? But through a couple course of events, I mean, historians differ on their opinions, but kind of something in the middle is around 50 million deaths occurred from that. So you can have kind of these things, but, but they can be taken different. I mean, I think of like the red hand, you know, mm -hmm. probably absolutely something that was inspired by the sons of Aries, the rising in Persephone. Yeah. A character I think about when you kind of in your reference point is Sefi. This character feels like slippery, feels kind of like you're not too sure, but at the beginning of her arc, her storyline in Morningstar, Ragnar's last words to her are, Sefi, you live for more. And for a while you think, 
yeah, like she's doing it, you know, maybe not the way that I would do it or the way, but Pierce Brown kind of creates this mystery with this character of like, and we know that she's capable of a lot. Um, if anything, she's smart, she's fast, she's violent, she's aggressive, but um, she's like, you know, she, we feel like she gets and understands what this, this group of people, the rising is trying to do. But when Uncle Nero gets executed by the jackal, it leads to chapter, I believe, 54 in Morningstar. And she starts executing golds on the, on, uh, on the Morningstar, the ship itself. And you're like, man, like maybe, you know, I don't know. If, I'm not, I don't want to point any blame on Sefi. I don't want to like, I don't want to talk about that necessarily. But it is on this sliding scale, this again, going back to the spectrum idea that you talked about. Because I think her intentions in that moment were actually probably pretty pure. Like you said, like with Chairman Mao, it's like, try, I'm just trying to make my society grow. I'm just trying to make it better. That's all I'm trying to do. So in that moment, she sees a gold, a gold leader, a gold oppressor kill a red. And she's like, these guys are all trash. And I just got to get rid of them. I got to exterminate them. And it's easy to have that kind of prism, that viewpoint for Sefi. I don't, I don't, I almost don't blame her because her whole life has been, she's been misled by these people. So she's doing it in the name of, she, she thinks she's doing it in the name of good but really it's an evil act. There's so much here and it's so complex and you have this kind of, you know, there's the spectrum can be beautiful, but problematic, mm -hmm. you know, Eos, um, what she espouses can be simple, but can be built upon. Yeah. And you know, what Darrow said is probably what people go to, but also is, is based on uh, vengeance and retribution, which we know isn't the dream. Yeah. So I, I think, the holistic approach to this is really interesting and something that I don't want to have the answer to right now. I don't yeah. have the answer to. It's something that I want to explore with you and vet out over these episodes where we can look at these amazing characters, the qualities Darrow's given them and how he's defined them as the dream. Yeah. It's kind of funny. You, I want to go back to something you just kind of mentioned here. You talked about, you just mentioned Darrow and kind of like, and there's this moment in this epilogue here that's really interesting. Because he says, you know, uh, I can be a builder. You know, he has this reference point. It's like, can you? Can you be a builder? Because <laughs> all you've done, your whole, almost your entire journey, what you've even thought of Eo's dream, because you had a, Daryl had a misinterpretation. I would say this. Can I say this definitively? I think Daryl had, for, at least for me, I, I'm not going to speak yeah. for you. Daryl had a misinterpretation of Eo's dream for a long time, mm -hmm. for almost the entire first trilogy. And then I think he grasps, he finally grasps what it is. But by that point, he's committed tons of like war crimes and yeah. atrocities and all these things. And I still, it's funny because that line really sticks out to me. Like he's telling the reader, he's telling us, I can be a builder. And Darrow is my favorite character in Red Rising. I've told you that many times. We've had many conversations about it. But one thing that's really interesting about the dream and the spectrum that you mentioned, and this is why I also feel it's right, because again, it's it's a little about, about Daryl, but it's about Sefi, it's about all these other characters, every character really, is that this is this story is gray as hell, like in a lot of ways. There's no, like the good and bad kind of all merge in this middle point. And like Daryl, and Daryl is kind of, he epitomizes a lot of what the story is. A character that's capable of great good and a character that's capable of great evil. And that's what I think Pierce Brown is also trying to highlight, that there's a dichotomy and Darrow is the kind of embodiment of the dichotomy of what can happen in a world like this, a world that, in his own words, that balances on the edge of a knife at all times. This dream is balancing on the edge of a knife at all times. It's an incredibly delicate like set of scenarios, set of circumstances. It's a delicate thing to try to achieve. And it, and I, I think we might even get all the way to the end. I'm not even joking. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. The end of these seven episodes and have more, we have exploratory conversations, but maybe not even a definitive answer on this is the dream of EO. I think, I think you and I have some other thoughts we're holding back because we want to talk about them, you know, as we go. But you know, we wanted to kind of present the opportunities here to, to talk about this, what the basics might be. Part of the beauty of Pierce's writing and one of the underlying themes that I don't think we notice very often is that Darrow is probably exploring the same question that you and I are right now. Yeah, um, all the time. Throughout <laughs> yeah. the first trilogy. Mm -hmm. And Darrow is a great character. Um, I, I think one thing that makes him so appealing is that he is real, to your point. Mm -hmm. 
he contains both good and evil, right? He's he's not just some virtuous character running off in the distance and, and saving the world. Like, <laughs> no, not at all. Like he's he, not Superman by no, no means. No, no. And he struggles through life. And I, mm-hmm. I think it his humanity makes him so appealing to us. Mm-hmm. As he moves through this first trilogy, like you said, he starts off with without a clue, right? He he views himself, right? And then he he kind of transcends into the final epilogue, which is what this whole thing's based on. And, you know, does he finally get it? Yeah. I, I think that's what we're par- partly what we're trying to answer. Daryl, like, as a character, and he says this a lot. Like, he, the things he says all the time, like, you can do a Daryl drinking game. Like, he talks about his hands. <laughs> he talks about momentum. He, momentum is everything to Daryl. And rage. Like, if you, if you like, literally, like, had shots. Throw, throw paradigms you in there, You would be too. hella drunk. But, oh, paradigm? Yeah, yeah, yeah paradigm. Just so the, the word paradigm those, those anytime four, it's said. <laughs> yeah, by Daryl. Those four things, you'd be drunk in, like, two chapters. Like, For just sure. blacked out drunk. And if you, um, but... One of those things is like momentum that I want to, I kind of want to talk about with Daryl before we kind of fully wrap up. And I think something I didn't say when you, in, our, in that one of those proposals about Daryl being that dream keeper is I think that he takes on like Dancer's words so severely of I am Eo's dream. Like it's my job. It's my thing. I think he does that not necessarily with belief or conviction all the time, but to give himself purpose. Because he's a he's a character that is constantly questioning: Is this the right move? Is this the right thing I should do? Is this what? And so again, we take that at face value because the character himself is telling us as readers: This is what it is. Like he's yeah, of course he's the dreamkeeper. He keeps telling me over and over and over again. Um, but I almost think that now with like this like kind of two steps back approach, I can see the maybe see the picture a little bit clearer. I think he might be doing this as a way to hype himself up and create momentum for himself. Mm. Like. You have these moments of like, I got to get out of this situation. If I die, Eo's dream dies with me. Or like, or if I can't make it through this challenge, Eo's dream will fail. If I can't, you know, I keep, you know, he does this a lot. You know, I think he does this in the lock, in the Institute. He does this in Olympus. uh, When he's, I think, believe when they're raiding, you know, all the the proctors like space. He does this when in the Iron Rain and, and Golden Sun. I'm not, I think in a way, it's just a personal take. I think in a way, he's just saying it to himself to to give himself that gravity and that momentum to be that that driven arrow. And that's like another another Darrowism <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> it was like kind of give himself like this, you know, a point that's just driving forward. Uh, so I just want to say that. So I think part of this exploration, we will be talking about Darrow a lot. But in this next episode, we're talking about rage. And that has mm-hmm. to do with Darrow quite a bit. Oh, yeah. But it also has to do a lot with Fitchner. So I want to give a kind of like just shout out to, again, the Sons of Aries Volume 1 and Volume 2 and say, read those read those graphic novels or Absolutely. how you and I did them, uh, the graphic audio presentation where it's actually like a voice. Uh, what, how would you, what would you classify that as? I think they just reenact the comic slash graphic novel mm-hmm. using voice actors, sound so design good. and scoring it. It's, yeah. Probably simply but. really, really fun to listen to. But you learn that this quality of rage was brought into the story long before Darrow's presence. It's brought in by a lot by Fitchner. Mm-hmm. And we're going to find out and we're going to talk about how the quality of rage fits inside of Eo's dream. That's going to be next week. So I'm excited for that. We're going to keep barreling through. And then, you know, the next week we'll have another quality and the next week, another quality. And dude, it's like, this is so epic. This is going to be so much of, this is of all the things we've done so far, even like not, not including talking to Pierce. But of all the things we've done so far, I'm so excited to have this discussion about and wrestle with the idea with you. What is the dream of EO? I'm pretty amped. I've got the uh, the goosebumps on the arms. Oh, I'm, dang. I'm, I'm getting nervous. So, <laughs> And part of what I can't wait for is not just sitting here behind the mic with you, but it's the conversations between Math R, you and myself discussing these ideas, these next episodes and, and challenging me. I mean, honestly, like I'm an open book. I can be influenced. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't made up my mind about this. Yeah, same. So not only the two of you, but I, I want to hear from our listeners. I, I'm really interested kind of as this goes up on the socials, as this goes up on YouTube and gets released on the feed, like what do they think? Do yeah. they have a fourth question? Do they agree with one of them 
and it's like really hardcore or <laughs> yeah. is it like D all of the above, right? Yeah. Like I can't wait to see what they think. I'm the same way. I'm like, I'm ready to receive like all, all the takes. And I just want to mention real quick for those who are maybe listening on the feed, we actually have this episode and all the future Dream of E episodes on YouTube. So you can come in, you can tell us how wrong we are in our takes about the Dream of EO. You can like, subscribe, smash that bell, all that cool stuff that people <laughs> say on YouTube channels. Until next time, Hail Reaper. Hail Reaper. Hail Reaper is produced by Philip, known as Oracle, Jeremy, known as Checkmate, and Matha, known as Broadcast. It's been to you across the airwaves, all the way from Deep Grave Studios. Our intro theme was composed by Matha. The track you're hearing now is Grey by Sahab. Our broadcast visuals were created by the amazing Leslie Ray. Thanks to Pierce Brown for creating this universe, and thanks to all the contributors who make this show possible. Dream of EO never would have happened without the support of some gory damn fine howlers. They're all part of our incredible Patreon community, where we issue monthly bonus content, exclusive artwork, and hang about with the rest of the pack over on Discord. Visit patreon.com slash hellreaper to learn more. If you enjoy what you hear, please take a moment to rate and review us on your podcast platform of choice, and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube for updates, giveaways, and more. The Dream of EO is a seven-part limited series, but if that's not enough, we host a companion show called Beyond the Veil, which will air live on our YouTube channel every other Monday during its initial run. It's a peek behind the curtain at what goes into making the show and what it takes to build a community online. You can send your burning questions about the series to hailreaperpod at gmail.com with the subject line Beyond the Veil. This is Broadcast, signing off. Until next time, hail the gory damn reaper.